Hello there, I'm Mount Payne 27 and this is Dean of Doom, the show we give grades to classic and contemporary Doom wads. Why? Because ranking things is fun. Today's episode will be dedicated to Community Chest, a treasure chest of maps from the Doom community released in 2003. It was a time of growing pains for Doom and its disciples, the source port era was still in its infancy, Alien Vendetta had come and gone, Scythe was a new kid on the block, and BPRD was still best known as the author of Nuts Wad. Enter Community Chest, one of the first Doom projects to be compiled from an open call for new maps. Circa 2022, community projects are all the rage, and CC is a bit of a fossil. But if you want to see what Doom mapping was all about at the turn of the millennium, Community Chest and its next two sequels are the perfect time capsules. Since the original project guidelines forbade custom textures or music with few exceptions, I've elected to substitute CC's stock tracks with Mid The Way Id Did, a Doom 2 MIDI pack released last year that sought to emulate Bobby Prince's musical stylings, but ultimately incorporated a wide variety of influences. Community projects make for some of the most eccentric and grab-baggy Dean of Doom episodes, so I hope you enjoy something a little different today. Here's how the show works. Every map gets one grade for quality and one for difficulty. On the quality side, the grades go from A to F. Grade A levels are fun, memorable, visually distinctive, creative, and a fair challenge. Difficulty grades go from X to E. X for extreme, E for easy, A through D in between. Keep in mind, I probably won't have the same idea about what makes a great level as you do, but that's okay. Disagreeing is part of the fun, after all. At the end of the day, this show is about spreading the joy of doom, so let's do so. Before we start, the rules are we play on ultraviolence and must pistol start each level. I need to play the wad twice before reviewing it. Saves are allowed, and we go for 100% kills in all levels, making exceptions when it's just not worth it. I play on Z-Doom with compatibility set to strict. Now, to the wad. Map 1, Pistol Panic. I'm hard pressed to think of a mega wad that gives a worse first impression than Community Chest. First off, I do not share the Ultimate Doomer's fascination with fake room over room. The results look messy and out of place, and tend to not be necessary or at least not worth the trouble they can cause. Pistol Panic is very symmetrical. The outdoor section makes me think of Kristen Cly's master levels, and the underhaul segment approaches plagiarism. Most importantly, I really don't see the novelty in planting voodoo dolls around the base. Like, at all. My best, most generous in-world explanation for why these things are here and how they work is this. They're supposed to be friendly marines in cryosleep, and you get penalized in health for shooting them. Even if that were the premise, which it's not, the awkwardness of the voodoo doll's presence smothers their intended purpose of making you think before you shoot. Finally, it feels like a smarmy move to give me a berserk and a shotgun after making me pistol a mancubus and a cacodemon, and it kind of defeats the purpose of calling the map Pistol Panic. I don't like this map at all. Grade D-, difficulty D. Map 2, Nulf Precinct. Welcome to Doom Cute City. Nulf Precinct's attempt at realism has aged well, carefully walking the line between granular detail and hey, look what I drew in Doom. The police sign, shooting range, desks with papers, prison cells complete with signs of escape attempts, and of course, the toilets make for a diverting gallery of sights on your way through this unthreatening map too. This is one of the best showcases of Thomas van der Velden's ability to use stock Doom 2 textures creatively. Grade B+, difficulty E. Map 3, Ground Floor. Your only adversary in this dimly lit basement is lack of room to move. The demonic infantry are light and few in number, and if you're not phased by having to take out a Baron and a Hell Knight with the standard issue weaponry, this map will be a piece of cake. Ground Floor is one of the most forgettable entries in this set. Grade C-, difficulty E. Map 4, Outer Base. Mr. Freeze's hard-rocking, straightforward MIDI is a perfect fit for this map. A brown outpost, it starts slow but finishes strong. This huge depression instantly recalls Crater from TNT Evolution, except Bad Bob actually uses all that space. An easy way to disarm the centerpiece fight is to spare the Mancubi before you grab the red key, but cut through their teleporting brethren like a hot knife through butter. The Community Chess series as a whole would have really benefited from more short, punchy maps like this one. Grade B-, difficulty D+. Map 5, The Forgotten Prison. Something feels out of whack about this map. The Forgotten Prison is flooded with beige, offset only by the occasional green. The aesthetic monotony can also be felt in the action, which... Let's just say Black Void decides and the shotgun sings the song. The first big fight, a teleport ambush with Hell Knights, Chain Gunners, and Revenants seems to trigger earlier than intended, permitting you to watch them kill each other from above and then make rings of buckshot around the survivors. The only other fight of note is the shootout in this grassy area, which you can exploit with infighting and patient shotgun work once again. The Forgotten Prison is mundane, but perfectly playable. Grade C+, difficulty D. Map 6, Going Down. Welcome to the first map that made me quit Community Chest. It seems as if the late Kevin Magical Ray developed 
this map in total isolation, inspired only by Doom 2 and its own unfathomable muse. Going down, no relation to the 2014 megawatt, is provocatively ugly to start with. Some of this texturing makes me grind my teeth, and the rooms flow together like scenes in a fever dream, pure disquieting abstraction. I doubt the effect is intentional. The combat is both harsh and wonky, made up almost exclusively of grindy, awkward, or clumsy scenarios that satisfy almost nil. Magical punishes the player severely for missing very missable guns and ammo, like this non-secret rocket launcher which can only be accessed by pressing these buttons that give no feedback except the faint sound of a door opening nearby. The lava room has a hideous, broken, and superfluous 3D bridge which you'll need to jump from to get the yellow key, and tread lightly on while chipping away at this baron. This brings me to the most glaring of this map's many flaws. Magical's brand of gameplay is utterly insane. Want to get through these bars? Just walk through them, but only right at this spot. Want to get out of this blue room? Okay, press on walls until something opens and teleport out, but you better wake up the revenants first by walking into the middle of the room or they'll pop up and kill you. Want to find the blue key? <laughs> the blue key is required to progress. To find it, you have to get into the revenant cage, then open a computer panel to teleport to the shotgunner cage, then open another blue wall to teleport into a different nook in the revenant cage, and then press on a slightly misaligned silver wall. Congratulations, you may now progress. The sluggish ending will clobber you with a claustrophobic clutch of cacos, elevators that go down but can't be called back once they go up, a nonsensical crisscross of teleporters that have to be taken in the right sequence to find the switch that opens the exit, and finally, a last-minute revenant teleport trap. Going down is perplexing, alienating, and unfun. Grade F. Difficulty A-. Map 7, The Boardwalk. We meet again, Gene Bird. I can hardly believe it myself, but The Boardwalk is a pretty darn good map. Despite weighing in at nearly 300 monsters, The Boardwalk feels almost fast-paced. The library computers actually work, to my delight and amazement, and I almost forget whose map I'm playing during this avalanche of activity on the promenade. The scenery's sharp, the corpses are piled high, and Visker Maelstrom's replacement for Sean's got the shotgun totally rocks. Of course, Gene Bird does still make some weird choices, like giving you the plasma rifle and super shotgun for running over a teleporter I've never activated on purpose, but the boardwalk is far more coherent, developed, and fun than any of his work in Community Chess 2. Grade B-. Difficulty C+. Map 8. Battery. The only weapon Bad Bomb places in this map is the chainsaw, so that should give you an idea of how this is gonna go. Battery is dark, square, and severe, packing lots of bullet spongy foes into a map with hardly any bullets. I may have placed myself too much in the way of bodily harm trying to get these Hell Knights, Revenants, and Mancubus to infight, but I guess it ended up being worth it because I had enough shells at the end to comfortably waste this arch file. Grade C. Difficulty B. Map 9. Flow. Flow is a misnomer. Most of this map is punching specters in underlit, anonymous passageways, wondering feebly what that switch did. You'll be pinching shotgun shells for former humans and enemies you can't beat with brass knuckles. Once again, Bad Bob seems to favor survival horror over straight fights. For a map with such a little action, Flow takes an awful lot of time to finish, at least for me, and I can't say it's ever felt like time well spent. Grade D+, plus, difficulty C. Map 10, Termination Center. I always want to say Termination Central, like Quake Z3M1. Kaiser is obviously a master of tech-based craft, but no matter how much I appreciate the geometric complexity and attention to detail in his work, I just don't engage with it. His monster selection reflects deep roots in Doom 64. Most of them are hit scanners or garden variety fireballers, which makes for meek and redundant fights. Even potentially challenging moments like this early ambush can be cheesed by waiting 30 seconds for the bars to open. Despite its swollen monster count, fighting seems to take up less time than switch and key hunting in this map. I also really dislike needing to know I have to ride two elevators into ceilings to hit switches if I want to progress, one of them under time pressure no less. Termination Center is too mediocre to justify its long runtime. Grade C, difficulty D+. Map 11, Mandrill. This cozy five minute break map presents only the slightest challenge at the very start when you're scrambling for shotgun shells. After interacting with this lightning bolt marker on the wall for a soul sphere and jumping for the SSG, this level is essentially over. Like Parsons' first map, Mandrill is tidy but unremarkable. Grade C, difficulty D-. Map 12, No Tomorrow. Oh boy. Get comfortable, folks. We've got a pair of used 3D maps to chew through. If this is your first time playing Community Chest, the next two maps are likely to take up your next two hours. No kidding. The decadently detailed Seweropolis of No Tomorrow is bleak, punishing, cryptic, and long-winded. 
The name of the game is acquire the plasma rifle as soon as humanly possible. Use 3D lets you know how essential it is by handing you bulk cells more often than shotgun shells, but taunts you by burying it deep in this level's dank machinery. Encounters such as the Yellow Key Caco Cloud Defense Force are all but impossible without it, so plan accordingly. Or just don't play the map at all. I deeply resent when mappers make me solve puzzles hard enough to be secrets just to progress, and Use 3D does that frequently, requiring you to find shootable switches to reach the Yellow Key and the Red Switch. That's right, it's one of those maps where the keys don't open doors, they can only activate switches that open doors. Hooray for backtracking. No Tomorrow is soaked in damaging floor, and having to ration rad suits wouldn't bother me if I wasn't already juggling ammo deprivation, difficult routing, death pits, and the generally truxelent disposition of this map. I quit Community Chest for a second time here, and swore off covering it on Dean of Doom. Even as I'm writing this, I don't know what made me change my mind grade D minus, difficulty A minus. Map 13, another dead hero. You might think excitement is imminent when you see the plasma rifle and rocket launcher sitting right there at the beginning, but you're not that lucky. Another dead hero is slightly more forgiving than No Tomorrow, but equally oblique and unnecessarily time consuming. Most mappers are content to just let the player press on a lift to lower it, but Use 3D prefers making you shimmy around a spiral staircase that provokes Doom's crappy collision, press a switch, and run to catch it before it rises. You'll need to do this several times, even if you know exactly where to go, which you won't. Use 3D also loves locking doors behind you, and in the case of this stupid sequence, locking doors in front of you and behind you if you're a slowpoke. There's a litany of vague objectives in this map, and Use 3D punishes you for going out of order. For example, you make it up to the plateau by the red brick building, but you can't get in. That's because you didn't peek over this ledge, drop down, kill the revenants, platform over a death pit, hit a switch, platform back, and then take a leap of faith into lava to find this now open door. Now that I've figured out a rough route after two playthroughs, I could write up a guidebook for beating this map, but I'd rather save you all the trouble and instead recommend that when you reach map 12, type IDCLEV14. Grade D+, plus, difficulty B+. Plus. Map 14, Substation. This is easily the happiest I've ever been to see Sam Metabolist Woodman's name. Usually it means I'm about to get my behind handed to me, but in Community Chest, he's here to let the player blow off steam. Grab the red key and don't worry about killing the barons and hell knights in the courtyard. Guess why? When you get your mitts on the blue key, two archviles teleport behind you, starting up a satanic jamboree outside. A golden opportunity to flex that plasma rifle. Substation is a timely recharge. Simple, quick, and deadly. Grade B, difficulty B. Map 15, Internal Reaches. An unthrilling, methodical clear-out operation, Internal Reaches contains over 300 monsters and double-digit secrets, but lacks the intensity and or sense of adventure that those figures suggest. Once again, Kaiser commits to a color palette, rarely repeats room ideas, and connects everything fairly seamlessly, but the action is almost entirely passionless. This pinky pincer room with the Hell Knights in the corners is the only moment that legitimately got me. Let me clarify, I'm not critical criticizing Kaiser's combat because it's easy, I'm criticizing it because it feels like he only put it there because he had to. Internal Reaches spawned three sequels, the second of which is Map 18 of Community Chest 2. Grade C+, difficulty C+. Map 31, Mount Chaos. It's always refreshing to see a secret map that wants to be a secret map. Mount Chaos is an eccentric key hunt that intentionally under-equips you, spawning in more and more monsters as you make progress. If you pounce on the arch file that shows up when you press this switch, you should be able to kite around safely while the demons bicker amongst themselves lethally. I'm not wild about the blue key room, the platforming is awkward and the punishment for failing it is death. The super secret exit is also super obscure. You have to shoot the wooden wall behind the exit teleporter to kill a commander keen, which opens up map 32. I've grown to quite like Mount Chaos. I prefer its madcap semi-pacifist action to a lot of the more generic submissions to this megawatt. Grade B, difficulty C-. Map 32, the Citadel. There he is. There's Gene Bird. After referencing Doom 2's The Catacombs in its opening room, the Citadel bleeds into a linear, forgettable murk of flat flat, dull rooms, long, plain hallways, teleport traps that hit like Chinese water torture, and clumps of monsters arranged arbitrarily, ripe for mindless super shotgun spam. I suspect the Citadel was buried in the super secret slot because it's butt ugly. This outdoor area is the worst of a bad lot. If you don't notice the red key and the switch that raises a bridge to the other island, you might end up assuming, like me, that strafe running or SR-50ing across the gaps is intended. For the record, it's doable, but annoying. Once inside the Citadel, you'll notice that Gene Bird comically locked every single door behind the red key. You know, to safeguard against people picking the lock on the front door. Later, he gives you a yellow key that is exclusively for escaping the room that holds the yellow key. Long story short, this is a Gene Bird map, and I suspect it's from the same crop that got shoved into CC2. Notice the map title is, yet again, stolen from Doom 2. Grade D-, difficulty D+. 
footnote. How the hell is this MIDI supposed to work with Gross? Map 16, Methods of Fear. A towering tech base in a valley of toxic slime, Methods of Fear is one of the shortest maps in this megawatt if you know what you're doing. Eliminate the demons inside and hit a series of switches and teleporters to find the red key and escape the base. Outside, you'll be accosted by roaming pinkies, imps, and hell knights. Make sure you step in this shadow where the last ambush won't spawn in and the switch that lowers a wall blocking your exit won't be revealed. Lever sprinkles rockets generously around the perimeter, making the final purge my favorite part of the map. Grade B minus, difficulty C. Map 17, Infliction of Hate. Anticipating this megawatt's final third, I want to publicly thank Andy Lever for submitting two maps that take less than 10 minutes to finish. It just so happens Infliction of Hate is one of the best maps in the set, especially assisted by Styles MIDI, which bleeds TNT evolution. Sometimes simplicity is key. Right from the start, Infliction of Hate hits you like a truck. Hold onto your shotgun for dear life and weave between Mancubi, Hell Knights, Revenants, and Kakos to get them distracted. If you flee into the next room, the guys in red will mow you down, so beware. With the SSG in hand, the scales tip in your favor, but Infliction doesn't slacken its brisk pace until the final Baron breathes its last. Get the red key, sprint to the Mega, and leave with 200 health and armor. Grade B+, difficulty C+. Map 18, Sudden Death. Not quite as aggressive as its name implies, Sudden Death put me to sleep the first two times I played it, but kind of impressed me on my third run. It's stately, slow-paced, and laden with quiet moments, lighting accents, and architectural touches that I've come to really appreciate. I like how it isn't afraid to take its time, leading you from the sewers to a handsome hub with an octagonal star on the floor, and through each wing of the plant until you find your way out and do battle with a spider mastermind. Put simply, this feels like classic, classic Doom. It transports me to the same state of quiet alertness that pajamaed 13-year-old me experienced playing Doom 95 before bed. I don't want to go overboard. Sudden Death isn't quite that much of a nostalgia trip, but it is a very solid map, and it strengthens my case for replaying levels you're ambivalent about. Kudos to Bucket for his sleepy reimagining of waiting for Romero to play. Grade B+, difficulty C. Map 19, Monster Mansion. It started off just like any other Gene Bird map. 300 monsters, Super Shotgun in the first room, Seemingly random groups of demons and completely new visual themes behind every door. But this time, something was different. This time, Gene Bird actually broke his map. If you jump into this pit without pressing the lion switch first, you might as well kill yourself with that rocket launcher because there's no way out. Thankfully, Monster Mansion improves from that point forward. There is an actual Monster Mansion, though it's more like a monster apartment building, full of 90s style Doom Cute, including my favorite, this quaint desk set up with a notebook, pencil, and candlelight to write by. It is now an established fact that Gene Bird can do libraries. He even manages to make these doors swing open on a budget, and his combat seems to get tighter near the end. This cave ambush strikes from both sides and teleports a Hell Knight behind you. Look at you, Gene. Grade C+. Difficulty C+. Map 20, Technodrome. Technodrome has the most original premise in Community Chest. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to find a bomb, which you can't miss, arm it, and escape within two minutes of doing so. It's a great concept, but I have mixed feelings about its execution. For one thing, I don't love the progression. Four color-coded wheel spokes lead to a crate maze, a cage maze, a blue maze, and a nuclear reactor. My favorite wing out of those four will give you leukemia if you don't wear protective clothing, and that can't be good. Once again, the Ultimate Doomer is obsessed with room over room, and though they're visibly worked on, the trick bridges and floors don't add enough to the map to excuse how easily they break and how ridiculous they make the monsters look. Also, dude, again with the voodoo dolls? I'll play devil's advocate. They are a handy way of deterring the player from using BFG, and enforcing penalties for inaccuracy isn't a bad idea, but they're so damned ugly, abstract, and fourth wall breaking, I still can't get behind using them like that. I guess I'm just not a big fan of the ultimate doomers thing, because he's nothing if not consistent and open about what he likes in a doom map. It just doesn't sync with me. Regardless of what I think, Technodrome is one of the most original maps around, and its ending is great if you're not going for all the kills. I wouldn't try to clean up the last ambush with or without the BFG in under two minutes. Grade B-, difficulty B. Map 21, Avenger. An unnerving start to the final act, Avenger is deliberate, stingy, and labyrinthine, a sinister network of knotted up back alleys and shadowy recesses, slowly pushing you to the brink of madness. The mapper, let's call him Svein, like Champagne, gives the player six berserk packs, a pointed message which only sunk in on my second playthrough. Punch everything, and I mean everything, because the rocket launcher and plasma are cloistered away in secrets, the super shotgun is hiding in the well, 
Shells and bullets aren't abundant, and running dry on ammunition at the end of this map is a death sentence. The arachnos, mancubi, and vials guarding the exit are not easy to box. If you make an effort to conserve ammo, this map becomes much more a navigational challenge than a physical one. For example, in the room with the caged baron, there's a slab of metal that's actually a really important door. It took me a long time to find that my first time through. Avenger is deceptively linear for how much it looks the opposite, and the numerous dead ends and secret nooks easily mistaken for mainline progression can fritter away an hour of your time. It does reward prior knowledge, but I doubt you'll be eager to replay it. Grade C+, difficulty B+. Map 22, Future Grave. I have no idea what possessed the folks at Community Chest Headquarters to place this map so late. If you've ever shotgunned a Hell Knight, you can handle Future Grave's worst. As well as it works in Doom 2's Catacombs, Megasphere's MIDI is a wildly inappropriate replacement for Dave D. Taylor. Ironically, this is the only MIDI in the mid-twid 2-pack that clashes with the map it's arbitrarily paired with here. Anyway, Ravage's visuals are sleek, but samey, which can turn you around in the first half. I find switches that unlock the color key they are a bit sinful. It's kind of sad. I've played this map three times, and I've never retained a single thing about it. I don't know what's going on with this non-secret Berserk and Pinky, but I can't find a way to get either of them. Grade C, difficulty E. Map 23, Blood Runners. Originally released as a standalone map, Blood Runners is another lengthy outing from Spain, lent an aura of mystery and menace by its custom MIDI, whose incidental long gaps of silence between loops improbably add to the atmosphere. Svein once again varies his themes, blending bloody caverns into industrial sludge, military barracks, marble hell, and Amazon warehouse. The last of these is a major time waster. You'll have to make two very tricky jumps to obtain the cell weapons, and explore every nook to nab all the kills. Bloodrunners doesn't punish you for ammo mismanagement like Avenger does, but I still recommend Berserk punching where you can. Svein kindly offers you an invuln to take on this enclosed Cyber Demon if you didn't find the BFG. Despite its overlong runtime, I tend to like this map. Grade B minus, difficulty B. Footnote, this shootable brick is, without a doubt, the most obscure secret I've ever featured on this show. Map 24, bring evil upon thee. Now and then, it's important to be reminded of the simple pleasure that is super shotgunning mobs of imps and pinkies. Torn's straightforward corridor culling is flat as an airstrip, but nicely lit and detailed. I especially like the ceilings. Resist the urge to ridicule the caged arch files because two more of them will flank you when you release the red key. Save rockets down the stretch to dispatch the last exit-guarding anorexic Martian with minimal trouble. Grade B, difficulty C. Map 25, Blood Domain. Mother of God, what a meat grinder. If we're going by difficulty per square foot, Blood Domain is the hardest map in this megawatt and it's not even close. Pay no heed to the modest monster count, half the fights take place on or between swells of damaging blood. If left unchecked, arch files and pain elementals will replace the fall in an alarming clip, ammo is desperately scarce, health even scarcer, and if you haven't noticed, there's nowhere to run. Only Mark Clem could write a track like this. It's such a ripper that both you and the demons can siphon swagger from it. After the Sucker Punch opening, Blood Domain is all about maximizing ammo and minimizing environmental damage. It's not big fights like the Backyard Spider Demon or the Cybee Showdown that'll get you. It's the wear and tear between fights, and nasty crannies like this Double Baron Beatdown and this Caco Imp Sewer Pipe. My biggest blunder in this recording was picking up two rad suits in the opening fight. It cost me about 52 seconds of protection, and if you think in terms of 10 damage per second, that's a lot. I also wasted a few rockets and didn't chainsaw enough. Yeah, Berserk is buried in the exit. Archfile 46 is kind of an asshole. Blood Domain so crippled me that I had to save scum my way to the exit, jumping rock to rock with 2% health, two rockets in my pack, and two kills still left on the field. I typically laud a map for being able to thrash me like this, but Blood Domain feels more like a product of weak project oversight than a special experience. It's way overclocked and understocked compared to its peers. Grade B-, difficulty X-. Map 26, Breakout. Kaiser's last community chess contribution is 30 minutes of decompression after the unbridled anxiety attack that calls itself Blood Domain. It's his most ornate map yet, a luscious blend of green marble, demon tech, and rugged natural scenery, though I did find some funky texturing errors when I revisited the beginning area. As pleasant as Breakout is to look at, I still don't appreciate Kaiser's tendency to drag out his map's playtime with backtracking and the occasional weird puzzle-solving stage. I have no idea what opens up the red key, for example. Both times I played this map, I simply reached a spot where I couldn't continue, retraced my steps, and found the red key cage open. Also, I don't understand the point of hiding the yellow key teleporter behind a scratched wall that shuts in your face if you don't catch it. I do appreciate Kaiser labeling a ceiling switch with a flickering light cue, though. Small mercies. 
Grade B, difficulty C+. Map 27, Afterlife. The only thing Afterlife gets right is its tone. This map is unrelentingly hopeless, hostile, and deadening, worthy of a serenade from Sign of Evil. The kindest thing I have to say about this map is it's a place nobody would want to go when they die. Afterlife is absolutely miserable to play, somehow longer and more tedious than Svein's other two contributions despite its comparative openness. Some of that can be blamed on its counterintuitive progression. Exhibit 1, you need to lower this barren face and walk through it to remove a barrier blocking your way to the blue key. Exhibit 2, Svein won't let you leave this ship until you go below decks of the plasma rifle, where upon a door opens with a barren behind it, allowing you to press a switch to lower the gunnels and escape. Exhibit 2.5, if you fall in the blood here, you can only climb out from two specific edges that aren't marked or visibly lower than the edges around them. And Exhibit 3, opening the exit is a whole operation of non-obvious button presses, followed by backtracking to the Cyberdemon Sanctum where doors have opened. The progression is bad, but Afterlife's worst quality is lack of ammunition. It's not like I wasn't prepared. This entire megawatt enforces frugality. However, I didn't even scratch 100% kills on my first exit, and while recording, I was whittled down to 22 bullets and 6 rockets, that with the benefit of shamelessly save scumming to punch revenants, hell knights, and barons to death without taking too much damage. Afterlife is a horrible experience. I don't recommend playing it. Grade D-, minus, difficulty A-. Minus. Map 28, Necrophobia. The shortest and simplest gene bird map in community chest, Necrophobia is another linear, undemanding SSG session made even easier by the free auto map, which points you to a secret rocket launcher. Necrophobia lacks personality. It's neither ugly nor pretty for 2003, and if I knew nothing about it going in, I probably wouldn't have guessed gene bird made it. The only clue would be this dumb sequence where you teleport to an island surrounded by damaging blood, and the switch that raises the bridge to safety is behind you. If you fall down, you can't get out, but if you stand where the bridge is supposed to raise, you can't die either. On the plus side, Necrophobia is downright pleasant compared to Afterlife, and I think this Soul Sphere room is the best gene bird ever made, cosmetically speaking. Grade C, difficulty D+. Map 29, Citadel at the Edge of Eternity. I've used the word sadistic at least 10 times on this show, but never literally, because I didn't know what sadistic meant. I want this word to have real meaning, so I'm not going to use it for the rest of the series after this. Citadel at the Edge of Eternity is sadistic. It revels in your suffering as much as any devil could. To the first timer, it is baffling, inaccessible, impossible. To the second timer, it's a Herculean labor. To anyone who comes back for more, it is an unqualified obsession. Here's some perspective for you. The DSDA UV Max record for this map held by Doom God and fellow YouTuber The Viper Killer is 1 hour, 8 minutes, and 20 seconds. For comparison, here's a table of UV Max records for some notable behemoths covered on this show. The time I spent finishing this map twice exceeds the amount of time I spent recording Scythe 2 in its entirety. The first time took 5 hours across 3 days, and then I recorded it for 4 hours in a single day. I saved vigorously, consulted Doom Wiki for progression hints, even watched Viper Killer's full playthrough to prepare myself, and still, I died or reloaded hundreds of times. Let's go back to the beginning. Kevin Ray, God rest his soul, was a practicing magician in the real world. Good enough to make it onto British TV, in fact. Okay, <laughs> that's three red cards and one, two, three black cards. <laughs> My theory is that Ray sought to wield every bit of the Doom Engine's powers of sleight of hand. Fake walls, 3D bridges, pop-up monsters, trick switches, trip wires, even exploitation of glitches like wall running. To Magical, everything was fair game. This was his very last Doom map, and from what I can glean, challenging maps were his bread and butter. So this was, as fate would have it, his ultimate statement as a Doom magician and as a player who embraced the game's most unmerciful elements. So. Specifics. The Citadel overlooks a deep lake of lava. To fall in without the yellow key is to die. The blue key unlocks the Citadel, but of course you'll need to get the other two first. Attacking the Citadel directly is suicide anyway, as there aren't any guns around and it's guarded by Hell Knights, Barons, Arachnotrons, Revenants, and Archviles. The tall silver poles have Revenants in them who will constantly hurl tracking missiles at you from absurd distances. The only way forward is through this enclosure. Hack your way through here with a shotgun and solve a puzzle with computers, switches, and invisible walls. 
Then, scale the stairs, don't pick the wrong door, and break into the marble corridor, the separated rooms of which are connected by this dark corridor, which is filled with functionally invisible chain gunners. It's not clear what to do from here, but you'll need to overcome four nasty challenges to raise four bars blocking a switch that opens another puzzle room. I use the term puzzle loosely. Touching certain parts of the floor in here opens certain doors, and opening the wall behind the rightmost door leads to a vital switch and a horrible ambush. The cubby next to this hides a switch that opens a switch that will call the elevator out of this hellhole. Then... <laughs> My god, this part. You go over to the southernmost marble room, watching out for those goddamn tracking rockets, shoot a skull switch in there to raise a step, and then parkour through this series of nooks without falling or missing a door. If you do, you have to go back and do it all again. Finally, you get to the last marble room, pass through this cage to get a rocket launcher, release some spiders, walk through a fake wall, hit a switch, and congratulations, you're about a third of the way done. A hole in the cliffside will have opened up now, which might take a while to find if you don't know what you're looking for. Once inside, do not, under any circumstances, go into the Cyberdemon courtyard or you'll wake up archviles that need to be slumbering. Sneak into a crevice that opens up by magic, break up the shotgunner party, climb the stairs, and then kill the archviles and revenants up there. Hit a switch and the red key is yours. Further around the perimeter, behind the red key door, there's a blistering fight with a slew of hit scanners and revenants unloading on you like the opening scene of Saving Private Ryan. Take the hill hit a switch, and then you're going down to the elevator room, which is one of the most excruciating parts of this excruciating map. None of these switches behave logically. Sometimes you're pressing a specific part of a texture or half of a satyr's face to go up, and sometimes the same thing makes you go down. The elevators are painfully slow, and the revenants, chain gunners, and hell nobles can see your head peek out before you can fire back at them. Plus, there's always an inconvenient something or other ready to bite, scratch, punch, or shoot you as soon as you reach the top. The stupid fake bridges tend to break, the secrets stuffed in the walls are really useful, Useful, but costs so much time to take detours for. It's awful, awful, awful stuff. After this, Magical literally gives you a bridge to jump off of. Really, there's secret health and ammo down there that you can't do without. The second room opens random monster pods wherever you walk and flagellates you with revenants and barons on either side. Then you go downstairs and meet the icon of bridges. <sighs> I don't understand it. I don't understand it at all. Then you shimmy past a cyber demon, beg your creator for mercy through this vile infested flesh dungeon and release the yellow key. Then you have to BFG a cyber demon while balancing on one of these f bridges over 20 damage lava, all to hit a switch that lowers the blue key, which is guarded by four more cyber demons. You know what, I, I, I can't do this. I give up, I'm sorry. After nine hours of playing this map, another two hours watching someone play it, and now three hours and over a thousand words writing about it, I'm done. I'm done. <sighs> this map speaks volumes of meaningless agony to me, and seems to delight in the torment it wreaks, not unlike an agent of hellish torture in video game form. It is, without a doubt, the most malicious, nihilistic, soul-grinding Doom level I have ever played, and its author's singleness of purpose is frightening to ponder. Grade. <sighs> so, Citadel at the Edge of Eternity breaks my grading system, because any map that evokes such a strong gut reaction can't be a failure. But also, a map so incredibly mean and intentionally exasperating surely can't get a passing grade. In short, I'm stuck, I'm tired, and I think the best way to move on from this is to admit that the grades don't matter. What's important, as always, is that we spread the joy of doom here. And I'll tell you what, Kevin Ray did that. He gave me a really tough dragon to slay, and I slew it. Just so happens I'd rather not attempt a dragon slaying of that magnitude again. At least, not for a long time. Some of you might find that you're buying what he's selling and Citadel might make your weekend. I don't know. I just want to make it clear that when I hand Kevin, or anybody, an F, it's not because they failed. It's because sometimes maps have to get Fs on this show. And when they do, they fit my subjective definition of something I didn't enjoy. I'm just a mountain slapping letters on Doom maps, hoping to promote discussion and get people excited about this game because I really, really like it. Anyway, <laughs> map 30, evil itself. A long and painful journey deserves a merciful end. Mr. Vandervelden, you have my thanks. Evil itself is essentially a monster curtain call followed by an easy icon of sin fight. Kill one monster of each type with a full backpack, all the guns, and 200-200, then warp to the final arena, hit four switches to raise the liquid level, and put a couple of rockets in the back of the icon's head. Grade B-, difficulty D-. So, 
I can't figure out for the life of me why I decided to do this episode. My guess is I gravitated towards Community Chest because I knew it would help me better appreciate wads I've taken for granted in the past. As they say, you can't have the sweet without the sour. Weird as it may sound, I appreciate Community Chest for the perspective it gave me. That said, this mega wad was hard work, taking me, on average, a half hour to finish each map. Staring down the barrel of 32 permutations of Doom 2's vanilla textures in the hands of not the strongest ensemble cast of mappers, I took solace in the works of my mid the way it did friends. My apologies to Varus Alpha, Decino, and Zulganoth for omitting all of your tracks in the lineup, but I did want to respect what little customization Community Chest had in its soundtrack. To make up for it, we'll listen to your music while we close up shop. My final grade for Community Chest is a C-. Not counting the master levels, it has the unpleasant distinction of being the first megawatt I've reviewed to not earn a single A. Difficulty-wise, it vacillates extremely, as you saw in the last 10 maps, but I reckon it deserves a B-, more or less on par with its sequel. Now for my Dean's list. Valedictorian, Map 17, Infliction of Hate. Salutatorian, Map 2, Nulth Precinct. Class President, Map 29, Citadel at the Edge of Eternity. And the dunce cap goes to map six going down. Sorry, Kevin. Thank you very much for watching, and please feel free to share your thoughts in the wads down below. I'd love to hear what you think, and I'll heart your comments to let you know I've read them. Now I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge my generous patrons. AR, Aaron Allen, Agu XYZ, Akali, Alec Wehrman, Alexander Sumenkoff, Alex Topfer, Alex Max, Bo Higginbotham, Builder Sith, Bitefire, Kappa Bitch, Captain Wave, Cheese Wheel, Chris Duthat, Chris O'Neill, Christopher Hart, Christophine Place, Crafty One Cal, Dan, Dave Davidson, Delirium, Dorothy Miller, Eggboy, Ember, Emma Essex, Faithful, Felix Wilson, Furnace, General Roasterock, Glenn Marmon, Griffin Upchurch, Gus Shade, Have a Seat, Holy Hell Revealed When, In Captivity, Jeff Hibbert, Jeff Sherilla, Jose Ballestero, Josh Ballard, Just Great 98, Camille Bernadotte, Killplane, King of Insanity, Leon Staten, Logan Lazalda, Mark Rowland, Master Drew 117, Matt, Matthew Gower, Michael Akins, Mixer, MK2021, Moko Mothman MM47, Mr. Meme 1990, Myolden, Neurometry, Nick Machado, Knights 108, Number 26, Omnibot, Orion Burke Poole, Painful Hill 72, Philip Coffee, Procrastination, Pyro She, Randy A, Reese, Roadworks, Rune, Sega Monkey, Sid Menon, Stone Mason, Stupid Nick, The Bell Tolls, The Dinosaur Heretic, TJG1289, Trilby Trillion, Turbine 2K5, Ultra Cow, Vertigo, Why Bemo Not a Crab, and William Huber. Thank you. I appreciate you all. This is Mount Payne 27, and I'll see you in the next episode of Dean of Doom. The first one's Map 6, which, yeah, I mean. <laughs> I guess I'll just save it for the Dean of Doom episode if it ever comes around, but I really have to be, I have to be bribed. I have to be literally paid an amount of money to do that episode, because it's going to be painful on a level that I have never experienced, I think. Like, it's not, like, Sunlust is jo is a joy to tackle compared to Community Chest, because in Community Chest you just get dud after dud, and they're hard to finish.